The Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. So we're here with Dr. Joe Lauer from the University of Wisconsin. Welcome to the show. Yep, thank you. Now, Dr. Lauer, you just talked about the top five limiting factors in corn production. Obviously, number one is weather we can't do much about. But number two, you said, was right. hybrid selection, hybrid selection, and hybrid selection. Right. Hybrid selection is really kind of key. It's what sets up uh, your, 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 the management of your field for the, for the, next, for the whole season. And every field is probably going to require a little bit different hybrid. Uh, uh, for example, some fields coming out of alfalfa or rotated into different crops or you know, just coming out of production for various, various reasons. Or on rental ground or things, you might uh, choose a diff one, one hybrid uh, over another just based on the kind of transgenic traits that are available. And uh, so that decision is made at this time of the year, uh, right at your kitchen table, and if you're not doing and not selecting a good hybrid at this point, then all of your management uh, from that point on uh, will become affected. So spending some time making that decision is really kind of fundamental to everything else you're going to do later on during the growing season. You talked about you know a strategy for selection and um, you know looking at multiple data, mm -hmm. um, incorporating your arm farm trials. Talk about a little bit about a strategy for selecting. Yeah, those one of the things that we're really picking up is especially hybrids in the transgenic era. We've always had a couple of principles where you use multi-location data, use an independent data source, multi-location data, and then also consistency for performance. And that's been a typical uh, approach, but a lot of farmers don't necessarily perceive that as being the best. Uh, for example, many farmers perceive that having uh, a trial on their farm or near their farm would be a better data source than, than, than uh, say, other, other trials. And yet, if you do that, the growers are losing the benefit of having all those other trials. So a multi-location average is important, consistent performance. And then when we talk about transgenics, there's three other things. One is uh, the seed costs of the, of the individual hybrids. Another is every hybrid has to stand on its own. Just because it's transgenic doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good. For example, in the smart stack hybrids, there are 32 different transgenes in that particular hybrid, and there are interactions that go on with those transgenes and the underlying germplasm. And then finally, and probably the most difficult, is to buy the traits you need. Uh, not We're kind of being forced to move towards more and more traits, and that has become uh, problematic, but in many parts of northern Ontario and northern Wisconsin, we don't oftentimes need the corn rootworm trait, for example. We can accomplish control of corn rootworm through rotation. Now, number three on your list was planning date. Now, Wisconsin, you did some data, and uh, there was one date that kept coming up. Yes, right. Yeah. We've looked at uh, planning date for a number of years, and, and there's a lot of talk about global warming and all these sorts of things, but, but really, when you look at planning date with corn, uh, the, the date that we've seen for decades now, we're starting our third decade of this kind of research, has been May 1. That's been the optimum planting date. So if you could plant all your corn on one day, that'd be the date to plant it on. But given, but it's highly weather dependent because in 2012, that wasn't the best date to plant it on. So what we try to do is encourage growers to spread that out a little bit. And uh, Typically, we like to see growers start around April 20th or so, get some of that corn planted earlier because then you don't have the double whammy of not only lower yields with later planting date, but also wetter corn and the economics of drying that corn down. And then be kind of uh, more or less midway to maybe two thirds of your planting done by that May 1st date, and then just finish up with the rest uh, in, in, as, as the season progresses. But it's very clear that as you get to the end of May and the beginning part of June, yields uh, go down, even if you switch to shorter season hybrids. And so you just have to, uh, uh, as much as you can, do uh, plant early and again, May 1. If you have one day, May 1 would be it. Well, number four on your list was weed control. Yes, again, early control of weeds is important. We usually encourage uh, pre-application of, of, corn, of, of corn herbicides just to get the corn ahead of the game. But if you don't do that and you're in a Roundup Ready program, again, early weed control will give you less yield loss 
then if you delay that, uh, the sprain or the application of that, of that Roundup or, or whatever post-program you're going to be using later on. So early weed control, usually by the time you're at about the V5 or V6 stage, you're starting to impact yield. And uh, you want to be putting on herbicides earlier than that. Now rounding up your top five was crop rotation and you had some great insights based on many, many years of trial. Right, we've had, uh, uh, we've been blessed in Wisconsin to have a number of trials that have been going on for numerous years. Uh, one trial at Lancaster was started in 1966, so we've got uh, whatever that is, uh, 45 years of, of data off that trial. And then we've got another trial at Arlington that's over 30 years old. And one of the things that we're seeing there is that rotated corn will always give you better yields than continuous corn. And I think most far farmers would agree to that. But what oftentimes uh, is there's a perception out there that continuous corn kind of overcomes, if you will, whatever uh, yield limiting factors uh, were out there. But we just don't pick that up. And this is over 30 years. Whenever you can rotate corn, you'll see about a, an 11 to 19% yield increase. And depending on how long the break was prior to uh, you know, uh, that, that first year of corn, you'll oftentimes see a yield bump the second year as well too. So if you've got two or more break years, like say you've got alfalfa or soybeans in there before you grow the first year of corn, whenever you've got two or more break years, you'll oftentimes see that bump year over the, for, for the second year. But if the break year is only one year, like say you just grow one year of soybeans, then that second year of corn is basically the same yield as continuous corn, and that'd be you know 30 years of, of continuous corn. So again, rotated corn will give you it's it's free yield. It's uh, it's a good thing for your for your uh, for your farm uh, program. I realize that that second year of corn oftentimes will have to pay the rent a little bit, but uh, again, it's 11 to 19 percent yield increases with rotation. And depending on how long the break was, you'll still sometimes see that uh, yield increase in that second year. But by the third year, you're basically at continuous corn yield levels. Well, a great top five. I don't know if we could do much about number one, <laughs> but I know everybody will try, uh, try hard to uh, brush up on three, four, four, and five. Yes. Thanks for your time. Good. Thank you.